Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome uh, for our visitors. And I also say welcome. And I say welcome from Australia. Uh, it is it is Mother's Day here in Australia on you know the uh, Sunday, May fourteenth, and. Uh, Many people are having Mother's Day celebration. So let me also say in advance to all mothers uh, that I wish you a happy Mother's Day today. And I thank you for coming by. So hello, everyone. Please come in and join us. Um, the time is so short now. I think that we want to be able to <clears throat> excuse me, we want to be able to be ready for this any moment return of Jesus for his bride. Thank you, Alma, which I truly believe is really going to happen any moment now. What I want to do, I want to start with a quick prayer. And then I want to get in and discuss with you. This is going to be something just a little bit different. And uh, dear Sister Paulette, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, everyone, please, I ask that you continue to uphold our dear Sister Paulette in your prayers uh, and, uh, and, and be able to discuss with her in the sidebar if you can. Uh, about what her needs are and how you can support her. She is such a blessing to this ministry. And I, um, I know how difficult it is, not only for her, but for all of us as we are in this late, late stage and how difficult it can be, especially as we are seeing so much happening in the world today that lets us know that we are on the very precipice of being called up into the clouds. And so, uh, and uh, I see a friend of God says, hey, Wayne, we are here also, not just Paulette. No, I, I understand that greatly as I just did welcoming everybody, of course, to the channel. Uh, and, uh, and that is also true, but I am asking for everyone that is visiting, including you, to be able to uphold our Sister Paulette in your prayers as she is here. So, okay, let us continue with that. We don't want to leave anybody out. Everybody is welcome to be here, and I thank you all for showing up. All right. We're going to cover, like I said, with a quick prayer, and then what I want to be able to discuss with you today is the feeding of the 4,000 and the feeding of the 5,000 and the crumbs from the table as all being symbolic of the three different harvests and how soon we are to those right now, okay? That's what I want to be able to discuss. Uh, and we're going to, at the very end, we're gonna discuss a little bit more about you know, the, the, the dirty feet or the, the sin that we have to walk through because none of us are, are perfect. Yes, if you are born again, you are saved. You have been forgiven of your uh, sin at that time particular moment. Uh, of course, we do have to walk through this life and we are not perfect until our bodies are transformed and we see him face to face. Amen. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's get into the quick prayer. Dear Abba, our Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for all that you do in our lives, for everything, for your very word and your word made flesh as you, Jesus, have come and you have given yourself as a sacrifice for us that we might be reconciled back to the Father, back to 
our Father, and, uh, and that, that we might live together with you in his sight for eternity. Amen. And I just want to, I just want to lift you up. I want to praise you. I want to thank you for it all. I want to thank you for all of our watchers, the, the listeners and the visitors and all that you draw to be able to hear your word. I, I, I ask that you cover the hearts, the minds and, and our, of each person that is watching this now that hears this message with your precious blood, Lord Jesus, that cleansing blood, that protecting blood that, that uh, you have shed for us all. And I ask that you will open up the eyes of our uh, inner being to be able to see just how imminent your coming for your bride is and how soon after that, after that seven years, you will be coming back to earth with that bride. I ask that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right. Let's want to, I just want to start here by saying that there, there, there's so much, and I understand just how difficult it is for everyone. We look at and, and we kind of scratch our heads and we think, aren't shouldn't you be here by now? I, I mean, how are we missing? all of these or are we missing it what is it we don't understand how how is it that we can see something and it appears that it should be so obvious that it's about to take place now and what what's going on what's going on are are we just so completely off the mark that that's the case it's something we have to consider but I don't believe that is in fact the case. I want to go ahead and mention uh, uh, just uh, have several of the watchmen have been talking about this very issue. And, uh, and so, for example, our brother uh, Ricardo Garcia, he just put out an, another video. And regardless of whether uh, if you believe that the in the pre-tribulation harvest or rapture of the bride as many of us do or even if you don't that's not the point if you believe that uh brother garcia may be slightly off in in, in the way that he's approaching things that is really not the point brothers and sisters we are all looking at this from our own unique personal perspective and we are adding to the, the knowledge, the picture, the puzzle, if you will, of all that everyone is gathering and putting together just so we can see just how close we actually are as we put in one more little piece into the puzzle as, as Holy Spirit grants us with the, the knowledge and the wisdom of what that one more piece is, we see how more fully that picture is coming together. Amen. And, and so one of the things we have to look at first is the big overarching umbrella, the, the, the greater picture, as you were. And, uh, and so for this, I actually uh, took this out of Brother Garcia's latest video uh, as an example and i want to go ahead and show it to you now and you can take a, um, a snapshot of this and uh and i think that that what this does is it really gives a great overall picture of when Jesus is supposed to be coming back, and uh, and so, let's see. Sorry, folks. Let me stop that. Um, uh, we want to uh, to be able to see just when is he going to be coming back, and then how close are we to the rapture? And you can see how he lays everything out here from a historical situation with uh, the end date of 
2030, right? And we've seen that a lot. And uh, there is an awesome uh, video out uh, from Messiah 2030. And I think that that is really great. Uh, and uh, I just really think that it's important for us to be able to just see, yes, we know where the end is. I think that I think that that is a pretty reasonable thing to see that 2030, even even the secular world with their 2030 agenda, that sort of thing. I, I think it all fits together quite well and how the uh, and, and how then seven years previous to that brings us to 2023. And we were right here in the middle of that particular uh, time frame. And I think that is really what it, what it is. Okay. Now we can argue about, and, and when I say argue, I tend to do this when I say from the standpoint of, of, a, of a lawyer, arguing does not mean that you're sitting here and rrr, rrr, rrr. it does not mean that. It means that you are giving premises that end up leading to a conclusion and that those premises naturally lead to that conclusion. And what we call that is we call that an argument. And so this is one of the things that, um, oh my goodness, uh, that's one of the things that uh, I, I just naturally say like that, okay? All right. So let's let's go ahead and uh, and and say I'm sorry I got my phone went off here I do apologize uh, let's see let me quickly do something here so I can let my beautiful wife know that I am alive uh, uh, let's see and uh, let her know. Uh, a video. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> sorry, you know, it's real life. When you do live uh, things like this, you realize that sometimes you have to make little bits of adjustments and things for that real life to take place. Amen. Uh, and so anyway, back to what we're talking about as far as uh, this uh, this time frame that we're in right now. And so we've got Brother Mike over at Repo Man 64. He has been consistently pointing out a lot of things. Everyone seems to be focusing in this small grouping, as you will, uh, in here in May. And uh, 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 some are uh, looking at uh, Passover, or what we would say true Passover, or true second Passover, or Shavuot, or uh, Ascension Day, all of these things, what are all of these are happening in this same time frame. We are that very close, I think is what we see. But what we're going to do, I'm going to take a step away from that for a moment and say, while I'm saying yes, 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 that is so important, let's talk about the three harvests. Now, there, there is something that we uh, consider here, and uh, there is uh, some, some pushback. And to be honest with you, I just do not really understand this pushback. And, and, and let me tell you what I mean by this pushback. And there are uh, those who, whether they have been given a revelation of the multiple harvest in which I have said from the time I have started this channel, and others are, are doing that now as the revelation has been given to them, about there being three harvests. And we just say that in general, excuse me, because, oh, thank you, Abba. Um, those three harvests in general fall into a pre-tribulation harvest, a mid-tribulation harvest, and a post-tribulation harvest. 
Now, as far as procedural components of this, uh, there are some that uh, say that, well, there's the, the technical post-tribulation harvest is, is slightly different. It's more of a horizontal harvest, you know, that, that type of thing. I'm not going to go into that in, in, in detail right now, and I don't think that that's really the point. The idea is that I believe that the scripture plainly holds out and that there are three harvests and that they fall at and based on like the harvest season. And when I say harvest, the other word that's used is rapture, or you can call it snatching, or you can call it gathering. And you can use whichever word you like to be able to use but it's all pointing to one particular thing, okay? And, and that is, uh, I, I think that is really the point. Now, here is what I talk about others that are against this. Now, when they argue against this, I'm, I'm using a broad brush stroke. I know I'm not, I'm not just like pointing my finger at, at any one particular group. Uh, however, there is on the fringe and i have mentioned like uh for example like the hyper grace group and that sort of thing now here is one reason that i uh now i i don't hold to all of the conventions of the hyper grace group and i am not trying to use the term hyper grace as some type of pejorative type of label. It's we have to be able to hold uh, certain groups to be able to identify them. And that's just an identifying label. And those are typically those particular persons that are uh, of the belief that uh, when you have been forgiven of your sins, then that's a one and done thing that you never have to address those or look at those ever again. You are what they call rapture ready and that you will go. There's only one rapture and you're going to go in it. Okay. And, and, and here's one of the things, let me just take a, just a, a side point to this and I'll tell you why that actually to me, even goes against what they're saying as far as they're uh, holding, as far as grace goes. Well, let me let me explain that for just a moment. If you are of the hyper grace group, or, or you tend to hold for those particular ideals, that okay, it's a one and done type of thing, and it does not matter that you are are in sin or that you have sin or that you, you you don't have to repent or do anything as it relates to sin that you encounter in your walk uh, with Jesus as you uh, are sanctified and that sort of thing. And, uh, but I, where I'm trying to understand and I, I just have a difficult time with is they are then saying, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope. there's nothing that can stop us from going in this one rapture. But then they're saying, if there's one rapture, then if you don't make that rapture, you're going to perish. And I'm thinking like, that's completely opposite to what they're trying to say. And, and I'm saying like, well, wait a minute, that's that, that, what happened to the grace? Didn't you say that everybody should go? There should never, no, wait a minute, you know, so that everybody that is not raptured is unsaved. Hmm, that means there can't be anybody left behind, right? All right, let me offer the opposing view, and it's the view that, that I hold to, and that is that God, in his grace and mercy, doesn't just give us the one chance at one harvest, that there are different parts of the body and they do different parts uh, of the, you know, the plan of God for their life. And, uh, and that there are 
three opportunities, as it, as it were, for everyone to have a part in the redemption. That to me shows so much grace, shows so much mercy. And I think that the scripture bears this out throughout the Bible. And that is different from the hyper grace holding that wants to take parts of the, the Bible and say that it's, you know, compartmentalize it. We don't have to look at that part, not that part, not that part. We're only going to go for that part. That's the only one that applies to me. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? I, let's take the whole of God's word and let's just find out what it says. Uh, and, and what I'm saying is that when we look at all of these, we see that there are parts that actually focus on and highlight a pre-tribulation harvest of a bride that not everyone is part of the bride, that everyone is part of the body, but that the bride is taken out of the body. And we're going to cover that some more in some detail here, okay? And But that the whole body will have a harvest, a part of the harvest. There's multiple parts of the, each harvest, right? If that's, that's what I'm saying. If that, think about it from this standpoint, a harvest model, and let's assume that, that you know everybody waits for all the harvest to show up. Everything is harvested all at one time. There's no first fruits. There's no main harvest. There's no gleanings. It's all just one thing. If we ever saw that in the Bible, which we don't, we are seeing that it's it's the same three-part harvest every time without, when well, I say without exception, I, I'm sure that there's probably things that we can show where people are not following that, and that's what God is telling them to do. But that's that's what I would say here. All right. So there, if you will follow me and give me the benefit of the doubt that there are three harvests, right? And there, so that first harvest for the bride that comes out of the body, the sleepy church, yes, the church, oh, shock, horror, is actually left behind. There's a purpose and a reason for that. And they will have an opportunity to be part of the mid-tribulation harvest. And we have a lot of scripture for that. And then ultimately the the, the remnant Jewish believers that are then going to be harvested post-tribulation and, uh, and others that are dead in Christ. And then the uh, Old Testament saints, which are going to receive their resurrection then post-tribulation, that's going to happen then. So there are three parts and they're distinct and they're distinct for a reason. All right, let's talk about here in this one instance, how we can show that there are, this, in this particular instance, I've shown, I think, many times in other messages previously. But in this particular message, I'm going to do it specifically from the feeding, the miracles of Jesus, feeding the 4,000 and the 5,000 and the crumbs from the table. Okay, now the, the reason why I say this, now I want to point out that um, there are a number of believers that think like, no, there, this is only one event. I want you to be able to follow me and I'm gonna show you that it is in fact two separate events, why it is listed different, why there are different numbers, what these different things mean and how they point to separate harvest. Okay, so let's get into this. So let me first talk about uh, what we talk about the feeding of the multitude. All right, so in Christianity, the feeding of the multitude comprises two separate miracles of Jesus. Now I'm going to, like I said, I've got a twist on this because they are separating two, 
But when we see it in its context, we actually see three, okay, that are reported in the Gospels in which Jesus used modest resources to feed thousands of followers who had gathered to see him heal the sick. The first miracle of the, is the feeding of the 5,000. It's the only miracle aside from the resurrection recorded in all four Gospels. And this is an important point, okay? So that is in uh, Matthew chapter 14, Mark chapter 6, Luke chapter 9, and John chapter 6. The second miracle is the feeding of the 4,000 with seven loaves of bread, not five, and a few small fish, not two, and it is reported in Matthew 15, the very next chapter. This is going to be important too as we discuss this, and Mark chapter eight, but neither are listed in Luke or John. It's a very important point, okay? So first what we want to do, or what I would like to do, is I want to discuss what are some differences between the feeding of the 4,000 and the feeding of the 5,000. Well, here from an article uh, that was written by David Bates, I'm going to go ahead and go through this, and he's going to give me uh, help to pull together some points that uh, we are going to elaborate on. So he writes, so what is the difference when Jesus fed 5,000 to 20,000 Jews, if you include the women and the children? So you remember that they say that it's 4,000 men, for uh, 5,000 men, but they, it, they had their whole families there, right? And uh, 4,000 to 18,000 Gentiles. It says the difference is obviously 1,000 between 4,000 and 5,000, right? But there's another important difference that I'd like you to see. Uh, let's see. The feeding of the multitudes was clearly important to the gospel writers since aside from the resurrection, it's the only miracle, the only one that is recorded in all four gospels, okay? The three synoptic gospels and the gospel of John. So I'm gonna read you first what the, uh, the miracle out of uh, Mark, in both instances, the, the feeding of the, 4,000, excuse, excuse me, I'm going to read it out of the book of Mark. I'm also going to read you out of the book of Matthew, and we're going to note some differences there, okay? All right, so starting in Mark chapter 6 in verse 35 uh, through 44, this is what it says. When it grew late, his disciples approached him and said, this place is deserted, and it is already late. Send them away, that's the people, so that they can go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. He asked them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. He took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke the loaves. Now those who had eaten the loaves were 5,000 men. Now let's read from Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. In those days, there was again a large crowd, and they had nothing to eat. He called the disciples, and he said to them, I have compassion on the crowd, because they've already stayed with me, three days, excuse me, and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way, and some of them have come a long distance. How many loaves do you have? He asked them. Seven, they said. He commanded the crowd to sit down on the ground. Taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. So they served them to the crowd. 
they had also a few small fish. And after he had blessed them, he said that these were to be served as well. They ate and were satisfied. Then they collected seven large baskets of leftover pieces. About 4,000 were there. Okay. So why did Matthew and Mark include two miracles of the same kind? Again, this is uh, Mr. Bates that is saying this. After all, if Jesus had already fed 5,000 people, what is really added to the gospel story by including a second feeding of a smaller number? It seems odd. Wouldn't it have been better to use that precious ink and parchment to record some other miracle? Well, his answer here is the locations. Now we're going to go into that. My answer to you is the harvest. And that's what we're going to show is something different. All right. But let's go into this deal with the location. He says the feeding of the 4,000 is important because of where it took place. The feeding of the 5,000 took place near Bethsaida, close to the Sea of Galilee, in contrast to the feeding of the 4,000 that took place in the region of the uh, Gerasenes, in the region around the Decapolis. Okay. So the two miracles took place in two different regions. So what? It's important because the first region was Jewish, 5,000 plus. And the second region was Gentile, 4,000 plus. There are some numerical clues in the text which also point to this distinction. Numbers in the Bible are rarely accidental. We're not going to cover that too much, but he says that in the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus takes five loaves and he feeds 5,000, which is reminiscent of the five books of the Jewish law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Not only that, but when everyone had finished eating, 12 baskets of leftovers were collected which is probably alluding to the 12 tribes of Israel and certainly the 12 disciples. And I tend to agree with that. We see this uh, quite well. There's also other things that we see. The, the number five is the number of grace and that sort of thing. So there is grace being shown, uh, of course, to the, the Jewish people. They are having an opportunity. Remember, Jesus came first to the Jews, right? And then to the Gentiles. All right. Then there's the feeding of the 4,000. In this second miracle, seven loaves are used and seven baskets are collected. The number seven is symbolic of completeness, i.e. not just Jews, but Gentiles also. And the number seven is reminiscent of the seven days of creation when God created all of humanity. And I would go a step further than that and say that that seven also relates to the seven years of tribulation. It might also relate to uh, as far as the seven days of creation showing that the complete week as it were. OK, and we're, we're going to cover that a lot more in a lot more detail. So I just wanted to start there. Now we're going to go in to I'm going to use another article here. And in this article, it was written by a gentleman named Sean Brasso. OK, that's out of the uh, blog for What Sayeth the Scriptures. And this article says the feeding of the 4,000 and feeding of the 5,000, are they the same or different? Now, the reason why I'm going into this, this has a lot more detail in it, and the differences are very, very important. And I think this is going to uh, reveal a lot to you. So let's go into this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me. All right. Thank you, Abba. Anyone familiar with scripture is aware of Christ Jesus miraculously feeding the multitudes. The Bible student will understand one passage where he feeds 5,000 
and another passage where he feeds 4,000. Are these two historical events or one historical event edited two distinct ways? In other words, was there a single multiplication of loaves and the other passage being simply discarded as a confused duplicate? Let us search the scriptures, and that's what a Berean would do, right? All right. So now I'm going to read you the account out of the book of Matthew, okay? In Matthew chapter 14, uh, verses 15 through 21, it presents the feeding of the 5,000. So let's read that out, starting in verse 15. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. Wow, that just suddenly, right at that moment, I was, I just thought about the bridesmaids that you've got the wise and the foolish virgins, right? The wise and foolish bridesmaids. They aren't the bride. They are the ones that are left, uh, that, uh, that are left, right? And, and so five are wise, five foolish, and we've got the five wise that tell the five foolish, we can't give you of our oil. No, you go into the city, you go into town, and you buy for yourselves, right? Doesn't that sound very similar to that? Think about that. Okay, as we continue, and it says, uh, so the buy for them, uh, themselves victuals or food. But Jesus said unto them, they need not depart, give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, we have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up the fragments that remained, 12 baskets full. And that they had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. All right? Now, let's actually then go to the next passage in Matthew. That's the next chapter in chapter 15, verses 32 through 39, which features, features the feeding of the 4,000, okay? Starting in verse 32. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting lest they faint in the way. And his disciples say unto him, Whence would we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? And I want to highlight that in the wilderness, okay? Verse 34, and Jesus said unto them, how many loaves have ye? And they said, seven and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks and break them, and gave to his disciples, and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat, and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets full. And they that did eat were four thousand men beside women and children. And he sent away the multitude, and took a ship, and came unto the coast of Magdala. Okay? It is rather uh, awkward, uh, the gentleman continues, to deduce that this is one miracle presented from two different perspectives. A careful comparison will yield the following seven realizations ranked according to their weightiness, okay? One, the gospel records themselves. If the miraculous feeding of the 5,000 and the miraculous feeding of the 4,000 were found in only one gospel record, Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, then it would be easy for critics to dismiss it as a writer being mistaken. 
However, the feeding of the 5,000 is recorded in all four books, whereas the feeding of the 4,000 is found in two books, in Matthew and Mark. It is quite difficult to conclude these are two views of the same miracle. Agreed. Number two, different crowd sizes. Obviously, one miracle involved approximately 5,000 men in Matthew 14, but in the other miracle, it concerned about 4,000 men in Matthew 15, women and children excluded from the numbering. Three, in different locations. The 5,000 sits in a Jewish environment outside Bethsaida. And while the 4,000 features a Gentile setting on the borders of Decapolis, Bethsaida is the northernmost tip of the Sea of Galilee, whereas Decapolis is at the southern end. Different numbers of loaves. Just a second. Okay. All right. Good, 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 good. Different numbers of loaves. Um, so let me reiterate that, that point. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get uh, sidetracked there. Bethsaida is at the northernmost tip of the Sea of Galilee, whereas Decapolis is at the southern end, right? All right. Five different quantities of leftovers. 12 baskets remained after the 5,000 were fed, but only seven baskets were left over after the 4,000 ate. Now, this is very, very strong. This is number six, different Greek words for baskets. The baskets concerning the 5,000 are korfinos, which means hand baskets, okay? while those related to the 4,000 are spiritus, or large baskets. And we're going to see uh, more on this below, but it says the latter, our spiriti basket, was large enough to hold a person, such as the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9, verse 25, talks about being lowered down in a basket. Such precise words are another indication that Holy Spirit would have us see them as distinct events. I would also say that it also has a much deeper meaning as to how much was being offered, but, but that's, that's another issue. Now, number seven, Christ himself viewed them as different incidents, right? Matthew 16 is the most compelling piece of evidence to prove that the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000 were two separate historical events, as opposed to one historical event viewed from two angles. Do ye not understand, neither remember the five uh, loaves and the 5,000 and how many baskets, kofinaus, you took up? Neither the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many baskets, spiritus, ye took up. You see there, there's Jesus. He himself points out that there are two separate events, right? If we have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to believe, amen, we will understand that there are simply too many differences between these accounts to make them one miraculous event. Additionally, if we understand them dispensationally, they must be distinct uh, occasions. As noted earlier, the 5,000 has a Jewish context, chapter 14, while the 4,000 has a Gentile tone in chapter 15. So, and I think that that is, we're going to go actually a little bit farther than that, and I'm just going to go ahead and uh, place in here right now is we're talking about three separate harvests, and we see Matthew as written to a Jewish audience. It is for everyone, it is for our edification, and we do not take it out, we do not throw it away, 
we don't just say that it's for them. Every word is for our edification, for our instruction, right? For teaching in righteousness. That's what Timothy tells us. So let's let's hold on to this. But we learn a lot from that. The, the book of Matthew is written to Jewish, a Jewish audience for them to believe in their Messiah. And then we have the book of Mark that is going to be, that's written to the left behind church. Don't bristle at that, folks. Just follow along with me and you will understand why this is the case. That's the main body, the main harvest. Then there is the book of Luke. And the book of Luke is written to the bride or the pre-tribulation harvest. And, and we're going to be able to, there's so much we could discuss, so many, many things, but that's what we're trying to highlight here. So even with those, when we're not even discussing it, you see that they are listed. It's not by chance, and it's not just to take up space, as was written before, but we have in those two separate incidents, we see that one is plainly written to a Jewish audience, right? Why? And it's in the book of Matthew, which is written to a Jewish audience. Why? But why do the, we see, excuse me, the second group or the second feeding of the 4,000? <clears throat> excuse me. I'm hungry. I want some food. Uh, why is that written to a Gentile audience? It's it's clear that it is, and 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 so what we want to do is be able to just, with Holy Spirit's opening up the, our eyes and our ears to be able to see what is being revealed through the Word of God, we see that, wait a minute, there's two separate events, and they're separated by time, right? Why would one happen, and then these other events happen, and then why would another event happen? later. In other words, think about it this way. Why would both events not happen, like, like, like say, the same day? In other words, why couldn't we have fed 5,000 in this instance and then walked to another town and fed the 4,000 there? Why could, there's, there's reasons for this, right? And I'm telling you that I believe that the reason is because it is written for a different audience. It is written for the left behind church. So let's say, okay, Wayne, let's assume that I even gave you the benefit of the doubt as to what you're saying. Where are you getting three? And why do we not see that? Oh, I'm glad you asked. All right. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that also from the book of Matthew. And we're going to see this very interesting, right? So in chapter 15, what we see, I want to bring your attention first to the verses, 15 uh, verses 21 through 28. And this is occurs before the feeding of the 4,000, right? And it says, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman, this is a woman of Canaan, came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Oh, I feel like, thank you, Holy Spirit. But he cried and he, or he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and brought him, besought him saying, send her away for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, 
It is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And she said, truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now, I, I want to point this out. I want to point this out. This is what I see as the representation of the bride. And this is what I see as the third harvest. And what do we see out of here? We see this, uh, this woman that came out of, of Canaan. And, uh, and so there's, there's a lot more that we can do here. And again, we're talking about the feeding and bread, okay? And what we're saying here is, and he's saying, uh, it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Well, what do we have? What are, who are the dogs? Well, we know that there are uh, the uh, Samaritans uh, were considered uh, dogs. The, the Gentiles were considered uh, the dogs, but the idea was that, um, that they uh, were outside of what Jesus was trying to do first. And what's interesting here is we say, yes, children's bread. So we see the feeding of the children in the 5,000 that occurred before that. And so then what happens after that? He says it's not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs, but she says yes, but even the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. We're talking about that bread, and it is the bread he's talking about. And what does he say to her? Oh, woman, great is thy faith. And I think that's one of the things here. We have faith in Jesus. We have faith in what he has done. We have faith. And this, this faith was originally granted to the Jews. Now, the Jews ultimately rejected their Jewish Messiah. And then it happened that it came upon and was available to the Gentiles. Amen. And I really think that this is an example of what that is. Remember that it also says here in Matthew that uh, uh, to him who is first will be last and to him who is last will be first. And I find this very interesting here is that the very first were the Jews. But then we see here what's going to happen is the last, not in the last instance, right? We're going to find something different. We see the very last is actually the Gentiles, which will then be first. And how do we get that? Because we see that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels, are given in that order. Matthew first, the Jews first, right? Mark in the middle and then Luke at the end, but Luke is written to the bride, and so the last shall be first. That is what's going to happen. That's why the bride is part of the pre-tribulation harvest. We know that the Jews are not going to receive their harvesting until after the tribulation, okay? So follow along with that, I, I hope. If you have any questions, like I said, uh, my uh, address is also listed in the description box. I include it every time I answer. Uh, I try to answer every single uh, email. That's assuming I, I have received ones that I would choose not to answer based on on what I've gotten. But I, uh, if if you actually desire an answer for a question that you have. 
I am more than happy to to try to answer you if I have an answer, uh, and I will do that. Just send me an email to uh, the address that's there in the description box, okay? All right, so let's actually go just a little bit farther here, and I'm going to tie some of these things together as we close this out. And uh, so here I'm going to give you, I, I want to tie in this whole issue of the feeding by bread and how we can know at a deeper level how this relates, okay? And what does this feeding of the 5,000 or 4,000 or loaves and the multiplication of that, what does that mean? Do we have an example in the Old Testament that we can see? And the answer to that question is yes. And let's see where we have this. Interestingly, so let's, uh, 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 Mr. Tom Harley had actually pointed this out. I thought this was very good and it was concise and I wanted to be able to send this to you. So in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 8, and this is Obadiah saying to Elijah, while Jezebel was killing prophets, I hid 100 of the Lord's prophets in two caves, 50 in each, and supplied them with food and water. Okay, now let's add to that. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 38. There was a famine. While the company of prophets was meeting with Elisha, a man came bringing Elisha 20 loaves of barley bread. I want to highlight this. This is the loaves, the five loaves that were given to uh, Jesus to bless and break were also Barley loaves, that's another whole big issue. Barley is the first harvest. That's why it's important. So he brings him 20 loaves of barley bread. Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said. How can I set, before, uh, set this before 100 men, his servant asked. But Elisha answered, the Lord says they will eat and have some left over. So Jesus was dedicating to bringing the Old Testament scripture back to life. Obadiah took responsibility in feeding 100 people separated into two groups of 50. This same group was also fed by Elisha, who gives precedent to the way Jesus miraculously fed crowds. Both Jesus and the New Testament authors picked up on these Obadiah-Elisha precedents. For example, in the, the New Testament authors point out how many loaves of bread were available, how many men were to be fed, the men were separated into groups of what size, and the fact that there were leftovers. And so here's, you can see how that ties in. That's, that's definitely the same. Remember, what has happened will come again. What, so was there a is there a prophetic meaning in that scripture? Yes, there is. Jesus, uh, in, in, in fact, shows that again. So there's two, uh, two instances where um, miraculous events of the multiplication of bread takes place on, on more than one occasion, back in Obadiah, back with, uh, in here with Jesus. And it also has yet another deeper meaning of the feeding that will occur at a later date. And what is that feeding going to be, you ask? Well, I'm going to tell you. All right. This is what I uh, am looking at the same thing. When I was reading this, then what came out to me was uh, Revelation 12, verses 1 through 7. And I'm going to go ahead and read you that because it's very, I think, very pertinent. And you're going to hopefully see some connections here. This is the woman and the dragon. So starting at verse 1, Revelation 12, and a great sign appeared in heaven, 
a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Many of you know that this is what we now call the Revelation 12 sign, right? And it's a sign that actually happens in the heavens, and we can see the stars. Anyway, she was pregnant, and she was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads, <clears throat> excuse me, and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. <clears throat> Thank you. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Verse five, she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. One of the things I, 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 I have tried to point out and I've pointed to a number of times, I, I am of the belief that this is actually pointing once again to the mid-tribulation harvest and the post-tribulation harvest, okay? Um, and, and so uh, others that have seen where uh, so the bride is already taken, and here we see that this actually is occurring at the middle of the tribulation period, okay? Uh, and at that middle of the tribulation period, then, of course, we... Uh, we see that this, the Antichrist, which is uh, the symbol that we see here, is trying to catch up this male child, uh, one who is to rule the nations with the rod of iron. And, uh, and so we can see that that child is caught up to God in his throne. That's actually a, a harvest. That is a rapture event. That is what we can see happening. Now, there are those that, if you can see a harvest there, and I hope that you can, uh, this is what I'm saying is not the first harvest. This is, and while I have other messages on that, this particular harvest is the second harvest. And then there is going to be a second one, the woman, which I think is indicative of Israel, she is going into the wilderness. What does she do? That's what happens when the Antichrist is in the middle of the tribulation period. Uh, we have the abomination of desolation of the third temple that's going to happen at that particular time. Then what do we have in Matthew? He says, all those that are in Judea flee into the mountains. Wow, okay, flee into the wilderness, run for your lives, right? And, uh, and we know that those are Jewish people. Why? Because it says, pray that your uh, flight be not in the winter or on the Sabbath. Well, would that matter to you or to me if it was on the Sabbath? No, I'm running for my life, folks. Uh, but for a, a Jewish person, it would be unlawful for them to do that. So they would normally not be doing that. So take those things into account. There's a lot more, but I'm just trying to be brief. Uh, and so that woman is going to flee into the wilderness where she is going to be nourished once again. And that nourishment is going to take place. And then ultimately, then uh, they are going to uh, uh, accept their Jewish Messiah, Jesus, on when he returns, and this is going to be after the tribulation period. So I'm going to tie this again with a, a, one more, and 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 what I'm going to do here, this is just going to be a, uh, just kind of 
uh, a closing bookend, if you will, to what I had said earlier. And that was discussing about the, uh, the hyper grace and the uh, no asking of, of forgiveness for any sin that would happen after your salvation, that type of thing. And, and here is what I, I want to be able to point out again, is that, uh, uh, and I did in my previous messages where I pointed out that while you, uh, from a salvation standpoint, you are forgiven of your sin and that salvation is, is if you're saved and if you're truly born again, then you are saved. That will happen. Uh, but there are consequences to sin. And being forgiven of a sin does not preclude you from being, uh, from having to suffer consequences for sin. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's what I was trying to point out in these previous messages. There is nothing that tells us that we are exempt from the consequences of any sin that we had. Uh, and, and we'll use just an example of, and this is, this is a harsh example, but you get the point. Someone who has actually murdered another person, right? We know it's murder. And, and, and they have then ultimately become saved. They weren't saved previously. They then get saved. And are they forgiven of that sin? I don't think there's anyone that would disagree that murder is a sin, right? And, uh, and so would they be given, uh, forgiven of that sin? Well, the answer is yes. If they are, they, they are truly repentant, they, they turn to God, they accept his free gift, you know, the, the, uh, turn to Jesus, having accepted the free gift that he provided as he died on the cross, was buried, rose again three days later. They have said, yes, I want that Jesus. I want to know that Jesus. I want you, Lord, to take control of my life. I want you in my heart. I want your forgiveness of sin. And, uh, and I'm asking you to cleanse me now by your precious blood. And they say amen to that. They are saved, right? Are they also then freed from the penalty? Or, excuse me, that's freeing them from the penalty of that sin. But are you also freed from the consequences that result? No. Again, you can be, but in general, no. So the person in the, our example has committed murder. They've killed someone and it is against the law, both God's law and a man's law. So while they have been forgiven of, and so no longer have to suffer the penalty, meaning they don't have to go to hell for what they have done, right? That has been unconfessed, they're unsaved. However, that doesn't mean that they're not going to go to jail for what they've done, right? Perhaps maybe then they are saved in jail. You, you understand what I'm saying? The whole point is the consequence for that sin is not what Jesus paid for. He didn't pay for the consequences. That's why we still get old. Our bodies break down. They get older. Why? It's a consequence of living in this sinful flesh. It will die. That death is a consequence of the sin, right? Uh, and so that's what I'm trying to say, right? All right. Here is one of the things that I want to just close this out with saying that Jesus did say, this is Jesus saying it, and you really have to try to twist it to make it sound something else, right? He did have multiple witnesses through his scripture, through his word, where he has forgiven people of their sin, and he says to them, go and sin no more. Now, from the hyper-grace standpoint, they say, oh, yeah, don't have to worry about that. I'm actually not a sinner anymore. I actually don't sin, you can't sin, or whatever, various different similar things like that. 
Unfortunately, that is twisting the scripture beyond belief. It does not work like that. And you would rest those scriptures to, to your heart, okay? And let's listen to what Jesus said. And why did he say that, right? Okay, so let's discuss that. Why did Jesus tell people to go and sin no more if sinlessness is impossible? All right, so here's the answer. There are two incidents, and this is from gotquestions.org, and I, I really like a lot of things that, uh, that they do there, and I, I like this concise view. I will go ahead and, and list this here and why I am wanting to use this uh, as an illustration of the point I'm making. In his answer, he says, there are two instances in the New Testament when Jesus told someone to, quote, sin no more, unquote, and they were each under very different circumstances. The first is when Jesus healed an invalid by the pool of Bethsaida in John chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. Afterward, Jesus found the man and told him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. That's verse 14. It is clear that Jesus knew what had caused the man's condition. We're not told the specifics of the man's physical impairment, but the context implies that it was caused by sinful choices. If the man returned to his sinful behavior, he would have wasted the opportunity Jesus gave him to live whole and forgiven. Now, what I'm saying is, let me caveat this and say, was the man forgiven? Yes, he was forgiven. But if he continues to sin, it's, what, what does it say? If, if you don't stop sinning, something worse may happen to you. Something worse than has already happened to him from the sin that caused the condition that he's currently in right now, or should I say the condition he was just healed from, right? So if he sins again, similarly, right? And, uh, and, and if he, uh, what does he do? Does he have to ask for forgiveness of those? Well, my thought is, as I pointed out, yes, it, it, it's, it's sin that you have not committed in your life experience, uh, and you want to ask forgiveness for those. You want to ask, you want to draw closer to God. You want to cl draw closer to Jesus. Ask for him to cleanse you of all unrighteousness, right? And, and, and to protect you, to, you want to get grow in that closeness, in that relationship with Jesus, because as you grow closer to God, then you are going to turn away, or shall I say not turn away from, you are going to sin less, <laughs> right? Because you are focused on Jesus. And that's the thing, right? We know what the works of the flesh are, so if you are focused in the world, you are going to do the works of the flesh, and that's going to lead to death, physical death, and, and assuming that you are saved. Okay, so let's continue. It says the second instance is the account of the woman taken in the act of adultery in John chapter 8, verses 3 through 11. When the woman's accusers brought her before Jesus, expecting him to pronounce judgment, he told them that the one who was without sin should throw the first stone. One by one, the condemning crowd left. Then Jesus told the woman, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Verse 11. She had been caught. She was guilty. She did deserve stoning according to the law of Moses. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the religious leaders who had dragged her there had no concern for holiness. They were trying to trap Jesus into saying that the law does not matter. Now, Jesus often reminded those religious leaders that he had not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it in Matthew 5, verse 17. He, Jesus, as God, 
He is God. Sorry, folks. I, if you disagree with me, oh my goodness, I pray for you. And I pray that your eyes are open. You really need them open now. Jesus is God in the flesh. Okay. He is God. All right. And uh, I, I'm just, I don't make any, um, you really have to try. And why would you want to think otherwise anyway? How would that be beneficial to you to make uh, Jesus a mere man that lived in a sinful body, a sinful flesh, and and then really? I'm, I'm sorry. No, that's not the case. Um, and uh, so let's get back to this. He, as God, was the author of the law, and that's what it says in 2 Timothy 3.16. The Pharisees focused on the letter of the law, but missed the true spirit of it, which is given in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, which says the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. When Jesus refused to condemn the woman, he was not minimizing the importance of holiness. Now, let me also kind of shuffle in here. We know that the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of it, everything that's in you, heart, mind, soul, strength, right? All right. This is the different one. It's the second is like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. When Jesus refused to condemn the woman, he was not minimizing the importance of holiness. He was offering her the same kind of forgiveness he offers to every one of us, according to Acts chapter 3, verse 19. In saying, go and sin no more, Jesus was not talking about sinless perfection. He was warning against a return to sinful lifestyle choices. His words both extended mercy and demanded holiness. Jesus was always the perfect balance of grace and truth. With forgiveness comes the expectation that we will not continue in the same path of rebelliousness. Amen. Those who know God's love will naturally want to obey him. That's John 14, verse 15. When we turn to Christ and receive his forgiveness, we experience a heart change. Forgiveness is not cheap. And it does not excuse the sin that separated us from God. It cost God everything to offer us the cleansing that pronounces us righteous before him. Rather than continue in the self-centered path that led us astray from him to begin with, the forgiven can walk in God's path. A move towards God is a move towards righteousness, purity, and holy living. We cannot experience the transforming power of forgiveness without being forever changed. Amen. I agree with that. It goes without saying that the woman caught in adultery did not return to her infidelity. She had met Jesus. She would not be perfect. No one is. But she was forever changed. Her eyes had been opened to the depravity of what she was doing. Sin no longer held the appeal it once did. When we meet Jesus, sin no longer holds its fatal attraction. Grace changes things. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Romans 6, verse 1 and 2. When we are born again, the power of the Holy Spirit breaks the power that sin once had over us. Once we lived only to please ourselves. But when we have been forgiven, our motivation changes. We now live to please God. It should be the goal of every Christian to sin no more. Although we recognize while we're in the flesh, we will still stumble. That's what it says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. God's desire for each of us is to be holy as he is holy, 1 Peter 1, 16. We still sin, but sin is no longer a lifestyle choice. When we fail, we can come to God and ask for forgiveness. And that's what I'm saying, folks. 
it does not mean that that one time back when that you asked for saving faith uh, to forgive you, that you never have to do that. Like you no, no longer sin no more. Yes, you do. And if you sin, you will suffer the consequences of that. So if you sin less, the consequences are less, definitely, right? All right. When we fail, we can come to God and ask for forgiveness. And that's what it says in 1 John 1, verse 9, and 1 Peter 4, verses 1 through 2. And if we are truly God's children, he will correct us, disciplining us when we need it. And that's in Hebrews 12, verses 6 through 11. He disciplines those whom he loves. His work is to conform us to the image of his son. And that's Romans 8, verse 29. Forgiveness of sin. Is there a forgiveness of sin? Yes. But the idea is, as we stumble uh, in our journey through this life, if, if you belong to God, when you stumble, get up and run to Jesus and ask him for the forgiveness of that. We know that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, or at least it should. If you are not being convicted of any sin that you have done in your life, then I would question whether or not I would question whether or not there's a deeper problem that we need to get to. And I would question whether or not, I, I'm, I'm sorry to say it. I would question whether or not there's been true saving repentance there in the first place. Whether So what I'm saying is, if you are truly saved, you have become a child of God. When we have occasion to stumble as we grow, then Holy Spirit will convict you of that. If Holy Spirit has not or is not convicting you of sin that you do in your life, the problem is far greater than that. And I'm just asking you to take that before the Lord before the Lord and ask why that's the case. Ask, ask for, you definitely want to ask for forgiveness, but there, there is a deeper problem there. And I am not going to, I don't know who you are. I'm not pronouncing something over you. I'm not going to pronounce a curse or anything like that over you. But I'm saying the word tells us that Holy Spirit will convict us that, uh, and that, that is, to bring us back to, to God. That's to help kind of keep us from that stumbling. That's, that's to seek and draw to God who loves you and wants to cleanse you, wants to heal you, wants to forgive you. He wants to do all of this. And that is just not going to take place if you just continue to sin like it doesn't matter. There's a deeper problem there. All right. So brothers and sisters, I hope, <clears throat> excuse me, I hope that this is, has been helpful and beneficial to you and, uh, and that you understand that this feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000 and the eating of the crumbs of that bread uh, that fell to the dogs is actually symbolic of the three groups, the three harvests from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And one being the pre-trib rapture of the bride, the mid-trib rapture of the church, and the post-trib rapture of the remnant, the Jewish remnant, and so forth. So, uh, I think that that really shows the grace of God and his mercy throughout. I really do. And I really think that above all, this time, the time for him to be taking his bride up is 
so soon. I, I'm just afraid that it can happen in any second now, any second. I really, I really I deeply feel so strongly it is so close. It is so close. God bless you, brothers and sisters. I love you all. And if you do not know this Jesus that loves you with an infinite love, and you have been drawn here, and you have not given your life to Jesus, you have not asked him for forgiveness, then I'm asking for you, first off, you need to believe that Jesus as God, he came and he died on a horrible Roman cross, but he died for your sins and my sins and everybody's sins because we can't pay for it. Only he could. Only he could. You can't work for it. You, there's nothing you can do to pay for it. Now, he'll let you try, but I'm, I'm saying, please, that this is the one chance you have because he gives you the opportunity to accept what he did as a free gift. You don't have to pay for it. You just accept what he did. You say, Jesus, I believe. I believe that you are God. I believe that you died on that cross for me. I believe that you love me so much that you shed your blood, that you died and were buried for three days and you rose again to life and that you offered that uh, that gift, the gift of salvation to me, and it's for the asking, and I'm asking for you to save me right now, to cleanse me right now. I give my life to you, and I accept your free gift, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother, and I want to be the first to welcome you to the family. Go out and tell someone, tell someone that you have just done this. If you've just done this, don't wait. I'm so thankful for you. I love you, brothers and sisters. And I'm so looking forward to meeting you all in the clouds. You hear that sound? That's a trumpet. And it's about to call us up. Maranatha, everyone.